In this video, we're going to be going over an introduction to discrete cubicle homology, which is a homology theory of graphs. Now, before we get into the details, we'll first go over some motivation behind why you should even care about this subject. So even though discrete cubicle homology is a relatively new area of study, it has already found several applications. These include applications to things like matroid theory, where there's this theorem of Morer that says if G is a basis graph of a matroid, its zeroth homology group over Q is Q, and its first homology group is trivial. There's also applications to TDA, or topological data analysis, where normally in TDA you go from a set of data to a filtration of graphs, and then from that you get a filtration of simplicial complexes, and then you take homology over this filtration to get something like a persistence diagram. But what people have realized you can do instead is you don't have to go through simplicial complexes, you can instead take discrete cubicle homology of your filtration of graphs to get a persistence diagram straight from graphs. There's also applications to things like hyperplane arrangements, combinatorial time series analysis, and actually many more applications that I won't go over here. In a very broad sense, in topology, homology is used to detect different dimensional holes in our topological spaces. And what we want to do is we want to kind of mimic that for graphs. So we want discrete cubicle homology to be a way to detect different dimensional holes, whatever that means, in our graphs. In order to make this more formal, we first need to define what we're talking about when we say a graph. So for us, a graph G is actually a pair of sets. One is GV and called the vertex set, and the other is GE and called the edge set. And this is a subset of GV Cartesian product with itself. And the edge set is subject to some conditions. So one is that it is reflexive. So whenever you have a vertex V, VV is in the edge set. And what this means is for every vertex, there's a unique loop on that vertex. And when we draw pictures over graphs, we often suppress this unique loop so we don't draw it. The second condition is that the set is symmetric. So whenever VW is in the edge set, WV is also in the edge set. So what this means is that whenever we have an edge from V to W, there's a corresponding edge in the other direction from W to V. And again, when we draw these pictures, we kind of suppress them and draw them as one undirected edge. So in particular, our graphs are simple undirected graphs. And oftentimes we'll write V tilde W to mean that V W is in the edge set. Some important examples of graphs include the line graph on N edges. So this is n plus one vertices connected by n edges, and it's denoted i n. And another important graph is c n, which is the cycle graph on n vertices. So it's n vertices connected in a cycle. Now that we know what we mean when we say a graph, the next step is to talk about what the maps are between graphs. So for us, given two graphs g and h, a map between them, or a graph map between them, is a function on the vertex sets, so it goes from GV to HV, such that it sends edges to edges. So whenever VW is in the edge set of G, then F of V, F of W is in the edge set of H. And what this means is that it says edges to edges, but it can also contract an edge to a vertex by sending that edge to the unique loop that is on every vertex. So for example, suppose we have the five cycle and the four cycle here. There's a map from the five cycle to the four cycle that takes a vertex V and sends it to V mod four. And that sets every edge to an edge, so it's a valid graph map. However, the map from C4 to C5 in the other direction that just sends V to V is not a valid graph map because there's this edge between zero and three that doesn't get sent to an edge in C5. The final thing we need to define discrete cubical homology is the notion of a product between graphs. And for us, that's the box product. So given two graphs, G and H, their box product, which is denoted G box H, has a vertex set, just the Cartesian product of the vertex sets of G and H. And there's this edge condition that there's an edge from a pair of V W to V prime W prime. If either there's an edge from V to V prime and G and W is equal to W prime, or V is equal to V prime and there's an edge from W to W prime in H. So suppose we want to box I1 with itself. Well, the first step is to take the Cartesian product of the vertex sets, and that gives us four vertices. And then what we can do is we can fix the second coordinate to be equal. So this is 
the w equals w prime condition in the definition. And this gives us two edges here. And then we can fix the first coordinate to be equal. So that's the v equals v prime condition. And we get two edges here. So, and this is why it's called the box product. As you can see, when you box I1 with itself, it kind of gives a box. We can use the box product to define what we call the discrete n cube, which is I1 to the power of n using the box product. And this is kind of the graph version of the n-dimensional cube. And you can see here are some examples of different dimensional n cubes. Given i between 1 and n, we can define two maps, delta i minus and delta i plus, from the n minus 1 cube into the n cube. Delta i plus is given by taking a vertex x1 through xn minus 1 and inserting 1 in the ith coordinate. And delta i minus is defined the same way, but it inserts 0 in the ith coordinate. So for example, suppose we wanted to compute delta 2 minus uh, from the 1 cube into the 2 cube. What we do is we first insert 0 in the second coordinate and then take the image under this map. Instead, we could compute delta 1 plus in which we insert 1 into the first coordinate and then take the image under this map. Given a graph G, we define a singular n cube or just n cube in G to be a graph map A from the n cube into G. We can then use these delta i minus and delta i plus maps to define the i positive and negative faces of A which are given by just precomposing with these maps. So for example, suppose we have a two cube in our graph G given by the map here from the two cube. The delta two minus face is gonna be a graph map from the one cube into our graph G. And it's gonna be given by just precomposing with the map delta two minus from the one cube into the two cube. Given a singular n cube in our graph A, we say A is degenerate if the ith negative and ith positive faces are equal for some i. And these degenerate cubes kind of look like maps from a lower dimensional cube into our graph G. Given a ring R and a graph G, we can then define L and G to be the free R module generated by all singular n cubes in G. We let D and G be the free R module generated by all degenerate cubes, and C and G be this quotient L and G by D and G, and this is the free R module on non-degenerate cubes. We then have a bunch of R modules in varying dimensions, and our goal is to be able to make this into a chain complex so we can take homology. Given an n cube A, we define the boundary of A, which is del n A, to be this alternating sum from i1 to n of the ith negative and ith positive faces. So for example, given this two cube here, its boundary is going to be this alternating sum of all the edges that make up this two cube. We then have a proposition, which is due to Barcelo, Caprero, and White from 2014. And that's that this boundary sends the degenerate subcomplex to the degenerate subcomplex, and that the boundary squared is equal to zero. So if in dimension negative one, we set uh, the R module to be the trivial R module, and del zero to be the trivial map, we then have a valid chain complex of these CNs. We can now finally define the nth discrete cubical homology group of a graph G. And this is defined as the kernel of the nth boundary map quotiented by the image of the n plus one map. And again, this makes sense because the boundary squared was equal to zero. So the image of the n plus one map must be contained in the kernel of the nth map. We can now compute some actual examples of this. So for C5, the zero and first homology groups are just the ring itself, and any higher homology groups are trivial. So C5 is kind of one graphical model of a circle. We also have models in graphs of many other famous topological spaces, such as RP2, where the graph version of RP2 is this graph here, where you kind of take this disk and you quotient by antipodal points. And we have that the first homology group of the graph version of RP2 is z mod 2 over z. We also have a tentative model for the two sphere, which is this graph here, which is called the green sphere, named after Curtis Green. And in dimensions 0 and 2, the homology group is the ring itself. And in dimensions 1, 3, and 4, the homology group is trivial. It's actually unknown as well, but the homology groups are for n greater than or equal to 5. 
If you remember back to the start of the video, we said we wanted discrete cubical homology to be able to detect different dimensional holes in our graphs, in a similar way that regular homology detects holes in our topological spaces. And one example that illustrates that this is actually what's going on is the following. So we can compute the first homology groups of the n cycle. And as it turns out, for n less than or equal to 4, the first homology group is actually trivial. And for n greater than or equal to 5, the first homology group is the ring itself. So discrete cubical homology kind of sees these four and smaller cycles as kind of two small holes and doesn't detect them. But for anything greater than or equal to 5, this is a sufficiently large enough hole in our graph that discrete cubical homology will actually detect this in the first homology group. Informally, the way you can see why this goes on is if you take, say, the 4 cycle, there's going to be a cycle in H1 given by the sum of all of the edges. However, this is going to be seen in the image of a two, the boundary of a 2 cube because we have this identity map from the 2 cube into the 4 cycle. So this cycle given by the sum of all the edges ends up being killed by that boundary. However, for something like C5, we saw that there's no injective or surjective map from C4 into C5. So there's no two cubes that see the cycle of all of the edges in the boundary. And kind of informally, that's why in C5 and greater, we end up seeing R, but for anything less, we see zero. So this is all we have time for in this video. Uh, if you've made it this far, I thank you for watching, and I hope that the video was informative. If you are interested in the subject and looking to learn more, I've put some references and farther reading on the screen that you can feel free to check out and kind of dive deeper into the subject.